You had a fun writing assignment in this last issue of Talk Business Quarterly. You got to be an upstart Republican waging a campaign against popular incumbent Governor Mike Beebe, whose job approval and popularity ratings are well over 70%. So how do you fashion a campaign against Mr. Popularity? Well, I can just tell you what I decided upon in my impersonation of a conservative Republican, and it was... Uh, uh, to avoid uh, extreme negativity, a lot of criticism, that'll backfire. BB's popular. Our governor's races tend to be a, a popularity contest anyway. I can't think of anybody who went hard after an incumbent and beat him except for Frank White against Clinton in 1980, and that was an unusual circumstance that was reversed in two years. It's, it's, it's just not Jimmy Lou Fisher against Huckabee, uh, Asa Hutchinson against BB, who was sort of, in a strange way, had some incumbent tendencies or... Uh, it, it just doesn't work. So, and, and, and then the national uh, wedge issues, the social and cultural issues, abortion, gays, they don't work either. That's, those are national issues. Arkansas is peculiar, uh, insulated from that. I simply thought that they ought to settle upon a young, talented candidate wanting to get his name out there, wanting to take advantage of the opportunity to be seen and heard and advance a uh, substantive policy position about an, a new paradigm for Arkansas government, which is to stop this inertia, this growth inertia we've been on for the last 30, 40 years, and find savings and find a way to cut taxes uh, and make us, uh, I believe I settled on uh, uh, more, uh, uh, less, fewer surpluses for tax receivers and, and uh, lower taxes. Uh, and for for economic growth. The growth inertia you're talking about is the growth of state government. Year to year, I've been covering it since, since uh, for, forever. I've been covering it a long time. Every year it gets bigger and bigger and not always simply by inflation. Think of, think of the things that have been poured into state uh, government's uh, budget over the years. The tobacco settlement, remember all that manna that just came out of nowhere that we got? Uh, in the recent session, uh, cigarette taxes, uh, in a special session before that, uh, severance taxes. Uh, we raised taxes for the school settlement. We, then we produced a hundred million dollar surplus, which enabled us to spend uh, 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 was a billion dollar surplus, which enabled us to spend uh, half of it to uh, to get out of court on upgrading our school facilities without any uh, without any uh, great harm uh, at the local level on property taxes. We've just uh, it's grown, and we've gotten into the habit of of, of growing it, and our Business climate is said by some people who keep up with such things to be not as favorable as some of our surrounding states, which is to say some of our taxes are higher than our surrounding states. And though I don't necessarily agree with it, I certainly don't agree with all of it, but I do agree with some economic conservatism aspects of it, I thought that's what the Republicans ought to take this opportunity to advance. Get away from the politics as usual, be respectful uh, and complimentary to BB. But, but let's start talking about how we can get some of this money out from under the sofa cushions all over state government and, and be more efficient in the way we fund our state government. And the premise of your article, one of the reasons why a candidate could run that type of race is because they don't have a snowball's chance of winning. Right, right. What causes you to go negative and spend a lot of money and talk nonsense is when you think you might win. And then your, uh, your, your message has to be tailored and you have to try to peel a few points off the guy. Uh, I had a Republican consultant who worked with you on your poll, uh, along Reed. with a Democrat, Clint Reed, mm -hmm. who set the threshold at 70%. I think that was tactical. I mean, 70% uh, for BB to, to win. But that would be unheard of. But he's trying to say anything less than that is kind of a victory. Uh, so if you don't really expect to win, if your point is merely to get yourself out there and advance a new message, then, then you can run that kind of campaign. You're not tempted. You don't get together one morning and say, hey, we're within eight. We've got to take some points off of him. Let's go after him on double dippers or uh, prison escapes or things like that. So it could be. It could be. With the right kind of candidate, articulate and able, it could be a worthy discussion about uh, the direction of state government that could set the stage for uh, the, the future of the state. Arkansas is changing slowly from a rural state to a suburban state. Not there yet, but, but as, voting, as the voting power shifts, if it does, from rural conservatives who tend to be Democrats to 
suburbanites who tend to be conservative Republicans, you know, like the white flat communities or the surrounding communities of Lasky County, this kind of message could begin to lay the groundwork for the development of an honest-to-goodness two-party system which we do not have in Arkansas. And one of the reasons, just on background for viewers and listeners, is the GOP has to field a candidate right. for governor to maintain their official party status. At this particular cycle, they've got, uh, you've got to, uh, they've got to produce a uh, governor's candidate and get 3% of the vote, or they lose that automatic position on the ballot and they're at their circulating petitions just like, uh, you know, an independent. And of course, they, they will run somebody. They've got about 27 guys running the U.S. Senate. If one of those <laughs> would, would like to do a little something uh, where he might even get more attention, where he could advance to the general election, because I think it's going to be Gilbert Baker who advances to the general election on the Republican side, probably, uh, uh, then this would be a great opportunity. But you need some talent, you need some intelligence, you need some articulation. You're going to get some attention in the statewide press you would not get otherwise. You're going to get one TV debate, albeit on AETN, watched by a few, but nonetheless, you'll stand there as a supposed equal mm -hmm. of Mike BB. What an opportunity for a young talent, and what an opportunity for a, new, for a new message for state government. That's what I settled on. It was a fun thing to do, by the way. I appreciate the opportunity to impersonate a conservative Republican. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I do have some natural economically conservative tendencies, which came out, I think. Let's shift gears, talk about President uh, Barack Obama. Uh, we measured his popularity and job approval rating in our Talk Business Quarterly poll, as well as Blanche Lincoln. Both of them saw some pretty negative numbers in there. Uh, Obama was below 40% with his job approval rating. Uh, Blanche Lincoln was even at 45-45. Her favorable, unfavorable was 42 to 46%. Do you think that the two of them, Obama and Lincoln, are they tied together for this next election cycle? I think they're tied together right now, and uh, I don't, simply because uh, we have several months to go, and one, the first rule of politics is that a year's a long time. What's, what is true today may not be true then. This health care thing, I don't know how that plays out, how the economy plays out. Right now, she has Barack Obama uh, around her neck. He's dragging her down. His, his, his what, 56 uh, disapproval, 56 percent? Yes. And it's out there in rural conservative Arkansas where they voted overwhelmingly for McCain and they think bad things about Obama. All of them misplaced, I believe, but they think it. Uh, she is tied up on the health care issue in a way that just weds her with Obama in a lot of people's minds. And then she gets double whammy because the few liberals in the state who would be inclined to support Obama are mad at her because she's not actually with him, as you know, uh, on health care. So she's, she's getting squeezed from both sides. Uh, but the main problem, I believe, I've said this and I still believe it so, I think it's toxic out there for national Democrats right now in Arkansas. And that, that hurts her. It makes life tougher even in central Arkansas, for Vic Snyder. Uh, I don't think he is in as much trouble as she, but there's something going on out there that I think is m most unfavorable, something in rural Arkansas that is most unfavorable to the national democratic uh, image right now. Uh, President Obama, Senator Lincoln met at the Oval, in the Oval Office this week at the White House. You wrote a column about this. What do you think they talked about and what do you think they should have talked about? <laughs> <laughs> well... I don't, I know one thing I'm fairly sure of, they didn't have this benign, sweet, pointless conversation that she described after, else there would have been no point for them to meet. Uh, at the very least, she asked for the meeting, and I believe what she wanted to do was to say to the president the same thing I think she said to Harry Reid, her majority leader, I can't vote for an opt-out public option. I can't do it. I can't vote for cloture. I can't vote for the bill. I'm in a tough race. Y'all been doing everything you can to try to help Olympias. No, we should try to help me. I can't vote for that. Neither do, I don't believe uh, Landrew can, Birch, Biden, else. I don't think they can either. Take it out. And let's talk about some kind of trigger. I think if I had, I'm, I'm almost sure that's what she said, but I'm guessing here. I'm, I'm, uh, but she's, she, 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 I believe that the, that the whole point of the meeting was to explain her predicament and try to get a little 
cooperation to her what she sees as her political situation.